This morning, though, I am really, really excited to have a guest speaker who's really not a guest speaker. He's part of our church. This is Michael Heidel. So, Michael, come on up here, and uh, you may recognize Michael. He often comes with Ray, and Ray's family with Sam, and I can't, I can't do all the kids right now. I'll lose it, but uh, anyway, they come from Grand Junction, and uh, Michael's really part of our church. He's usually always there at Chew the Fat, so we talk most weeks, and uh, Michael's been uh, a pastor. He's going to tell you a little bit about that. Married to Jill yep. and uh, walked away from the uh, pastorate some, some years ago. And yet God said, yeah, you're not done. You're not so done. you have more to teach, more to say. And so he's, uh, he's been teaching this course that he's developed, Identity to, to Destiny. And uh, he can, he'll tell you a little bit about that's your story, right? So that's people story. want to be a part of it. But uh, what I love about Michael is um, it, it's just his excitement about Jesus. Come so, on. yeah. So, okay, so in that too. So I'm preaching, and, <laughs> you know, we're descendants of Presbyterians, a lot of us. And I hear this, come on, come on. I'm like, what is going on? I go, it's Michael. He's, ex- come on. He's excited about come the gospel. On. That's really true. So I asked Michael if he would share his story, and he preached to us today. And uh, we're already too late, so I just got to give it over to you. But right. I'm going to pray. So, God, I thank you so much for Michael, and I thank you for your story um, in, in Mike. That, well, Michael is your story. Come on. So, Lord, yeah, there we go. So, Jesus, I pray that we would be open to what you have to say to us through Michael. That, Lord, you're, you're in Michael, you're in us. Lord, knit your body together uh, through, um, through this word, your word. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, this is, this is uh, really such an honor, you know, um, just, just to be up here where Peter Hyatt preaches, you know, I mean, come on, you know, and, uh, you know. You need to say that to my kids. Okay, well, you know, okay, I'll tell them. No, it's just so exciting, and why do you get so excited, Michael? Because I have been on both sides. You know, I have been there and back. I, I am that prodigal that left and was in the pigs, and came back, but I didn't come back. Papa came and got me. You know, that's so amazing. So, so Peter said, can you come share your story? And I'm thinking, okay, what's my story? What's my story? And, and really, my story is about this kid that um, finds his identity and finds his destiny. So my story is identity to destiny. If you got that slide up there, identity to destiny. And it's a, it's a story, it's my story that I've been de- developing for the past eight years. Uh, so I will start laying down this story. You know, destination is the place you end up, but destiny is the path you take getting there. Identity will determine your destiny. Always, every time. Whether it's the true identity or the false identity, that's the path you're taking towards your destination. We all came from one place, we're all returning to one place. But the path we take to get there may be different depending on the identity that we have taken on. And so I am a former pastor um, that walked away. I was hurt, I was hurting, uh, I was in a a terrible marriage, Uh, uh, so I walked away from, from the the pastorship. I walked away from ministry. I was mad at God and all of his kids. I was mad. I mean, I could pray for people and things would happen in their life. I would pray for my life and nothing. You guys ever been there? Yes. And so I walked away. Just, I'm done. I'm out of here. Went back to a lifestyle. Walked away from the marriage. Walked away from everything. Uh, went back to an old lifestyle of drinking and partying and all that kind of stuff. The, the life that I left so that I could become this awesome pastor and surely God's going to love me now because I'm a pastor. Come on. And I found out I was just as miserable as a pastor as I was when I was doing the other. So I thought, well, I know what the other's like. I'll just go back to the other. So I walked away. For 10 years, I walked away. And then I saw my, I got remarried to a wonderful woman named Jill I, uh, my daughter, I have a, a daughter from, a pre, from my previous marriage. I saw my granddaughter be born. I thought, well, that's way cool. But I was getting sick and tired. I was drinking every day. I was just, but I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I told God, um, I'm done. I said, just come get me. I'm tired. I, I saw my granddaughter be born. 
I said, I'm good. I've, I've done it all. I'm, I'm not going to do the Christian thing. I'm, I'm just done. And I happened to be driving back, and I do a lot of traveling for my job, and I happened to be driving back from Durango, Colorado, and in my truck, and there is absolutely nothing in my truck that is even resembling Christian or Christ or God. And I'm listening to the radio, and I'm starting to come down this huge valley, and I hit the preset, and this song came on, and this is what I hear. Sometimes God will let you hear what you need to hear to get you where he wants you. So this is what I heard, this song just ending that says, there will be highs, there will be lows, it will be all right because Jesus is in control. And I was like, oh, it touched my heart. And I go, oh, that was so good. I would love to hear that song. Hit the very next preset. Nothing Christian in my truck. The song just started up again. I'm coming down into this huge valley, and I am overwhelmed by the presence of God. Just my heart is just overwhelmed, and I'm grabbing the steering wheel, coming down into this valley. I'm in tears, and I literally felt his robe come across my arms as I'm bawling. And I look up, and I said, I cannot go back and be a servant in your household. It is just too painful and I hear him say, I don't want you to be a servant in my household. I have enough of those. I just want you to be my son. Whew. That's when I realized I had no idea what it meant to just be a son. I thought you became a Christian and you had to do something. I didn't know that I could just be a son. And so that began what I call my second journey. I call it my second journey. That was fall of 2016. And... Um, I don't want to get too far off here. Uh, so I want to start with this. I kind of have this uh, mantra that I have kind of put together that, that the Papa has given me. He's Papa now, by the way. The Papa has given me that uh, kind of really describes this past eight years. And so um, it's called the razor's edge. And so I'm just going to read this to you. It's up there, yeah. So where my wounds touch his healing, I find my identity. Where my weakness touches his strength, I find my perseverance. Where my surrender meets his embrace, I find my destiny. It's on this razor's edge of reality, I find my message to deliver to the world. I am the message. It's identity to destiny. When you find, when, I mean, when you start coming into your, your true identity, not what people have told you, not what society has told you, not what your parents have told you. When you find at the core of your being, your true identity, your true DNA, DNA, divine nature attribute. When you come to your true DNA, that that God knit in you when you were in your mother's womb at conception, when you begin to find that identity, your destiny changes. When I was coming back on that road, uh, in that, coming into that valley, um, I told God, I, I, I said, I am not going back into ministry. And here we are. <laughs> because I'm not in ministry. I'm just telling you me. I'm just being me. I'm just going to be me, and that's the message. You know, when I teach identity to destiny, it's, uh, we do it in a weekend seminar. I've, I've actually narrowed it down to a weekend seminar. We can do it from Friday evening, all day Saturday, and then Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're going to do it again in January, second weekend of January, and we're going to do an online option for it this time for those that can't make it to Grand Junction to do it. But when I teach this, I really get into how identity changes everything. Identity changes everything. Identity changes everything. I developed this this course, this teaching, when I was uh, uh, ministering in the prison system uh, down in Delta, Colorado. It was, it was coming out of me while I was teaching these inmates. And as it's coming out of me while I'm teaching these inmates, I'm thinking, somebody needs to write this down. And so on my way home, driving home, I would be doing the video or the audio recording to record it so I could write it down and then go back and tell them what uh, Papa was showing me, and then we just, I just kind of developed it. So it's a weekend seminar. But so to tell my story, I, I didn't want the God of the Christians. I'd seen that God. I didn't want the God of the Hindu. I didn't want the God of the Muslim. I wanted the God of creation. 
And I told God when I started that journey, I said, I just want the truth. There's only one truth. There may be 40,000 denominational thoughts of what that truth is, but there's just one truth. There may be 10,000 religions about truth, but there's just one truth. There may be millions and millions of thoughts of what truth is, but there's just one truth. And that's what I wanted. And I said, I want the truth no matter where it takes me, even if I'm the only one standing there. And let me tell you something. This journey, <laughs> thank you, Peter, come on. This journey of searching for the truth, you will very often find yourself the only one standing there. You've got to get away from the masses to find the truth. You have to go into the wilderness. You have to go into the cave at Patmos like John did. You have to do that. In my search, and as I began to search, at one point uh, about a year ago, I'm like finding this incredible revelation stuff. I'm like searching and digging. It's like, you know, uh, just digging in or getting stuff. And um, it's like Brent was saying, you got to dig, dig, and you got to get messy. Well, I'm digging, digging, digging. And one time I stopped and I go, Papa, why didn't you make this easy for everybody to find? And he said, well, you found it, didn't you? No. If I can find it, anybody can find it. You just got to go looking for it. It's not going to just be handed to us. We have to go looking for it. If we're looking for it, we will find it. He that seeks will find. If you're looking for it, you will find it. So in my journey, my second journey, I began with this one phrase. Why do I believe what I believe? That started it. I took everything that I believed and I put it right here. Why do I believe what I believe? How do I know it's truth? How do I know it isn't just what somebody told me was truth? I believed was truth. I've been regurgitating as truth. But it's not really truth. How do I know it's the truth? There's just one truth. And just because the masses believe it's truth doesn't mean it's true. For thousands of years, the entire world population thought the earth was flat. Just because they believed it was flat didn't make it flat. And then when they discovered that it was round, it didn't suddenly become round. It was round whether they knew it to be round or not. There is a truth that is true whether you believe it or not. But are you willing to do the search? And it led me to this next statement, that what I believe does not change the truth, but the truth, if I let it, will change what I believe. See, I had to stop trying to make the truth fit my beliefs, and I had to start letting the truth change my beliefs. I kept trying to force it to fit, and I've come to that point of saying, I'm putting everything that I know as truth and believe to be truth in an open hand. And I'm going to leave it there and everything gets washed away. Because you know what? The truth is the truth. And what I have discovered on my search for truth, and I've started searching far and wide for truth. I was leaving no stone unturned. I was going. And what I have found in my search for truth is that even, because that was the thing, don't go searching. You don't want to get off, off track. You, you don't want to be misled. You know, you stick to what we tell you is truth. You don't want to be misled. Well, what I have found is that when I'm searching for truth, even if I get off track, guess what? The truth will always bring you back to truth if you really want the truth. You can't get off track if you're looking for the truth. But you're going to have to let go of some things that you thought were truth and be willing to let the truth change what you believe. So that's my journey. And as I'm doing that, I'm learning my new identity. I'm finding out who I truly am. And I'm gonna get into that here pretty quick because I know where time's ticking. Um, so I went back to that place, that huge valley where it all happened. I want to go back and just touch this sacred place, right? <laughs> it's amazing we get caught on those moments. Like, oh, it happened here. I want to go back there. And I went back, and it's actually called, you got that slide up there, Sasha? <laughs> Disappointment Valley. I kid you not. That's the name of the place where it happened. And that's where I was. Physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. 
I was coming down into Disappointment Valley. That's where I was when Papa came and got me. And I had that vision when he came and got me, like the prodigal son, when I came to his senses and he went back. And I'm like, no, Papa came and got me. Because like Peter said, no, you're not done. This isn't, this isn't your destiny. You've just been wearing the wrong identity. And that's what I tell those guys in the, in the prison. They're sitting there in their green jumpsuits, you know. <laughs> and I say, if you're not where you want to be, it's because you're wearing the wrong identity. You don't know who you are. Find out who you are at the core of your being, and that'll put you on the right destiny. So I went back to Disappointment Valley, and um, where am I? And so I, I began my search. And as I began to, I went, I went to where I kind of started the first time I started my journey, my first journey. I went to the book of John. That's where I started my first journey was in the book of John. And, um, you know, you, the, 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 <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The four Gospels. You know, and you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you're going, hey, these guys were, these guys were there. They saw the same thing. You get to John, you're like, what happened? John, were you even there? You know, I mean, it's like, just like, what happened, John? You know, and then, well, he wrote that after he got back from Patmos. So he had a lot of time to get to know Christ here. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us what Jesus did. John tells us who Jesus is. I am. All the I am's. I and the Father are one. All of that. I love John. So I'm reading through John, and, I, and the things were just, boom, the paradigm shift stuff, you know, boom. Same facts, just different meaning as I begin to search through. And everything was just brand new. I'd walk the trail down by the river, out by my house, asking questions, talking out loud. Only one on this journey because nobody else was understanding it because I didn't understand it. But I didn't want to associate with Christians because I didn't want that influence in my life. So I'm walking the trail and I'm just having this conversation. And I get to this place in John 14, 20. And I get stuck. John 14, 20. We can show that slide. I think I have it on there, don't I? John 14, 20 says that, uh, and in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And I got stuck. And I said, what? In that day? When is that day? Well, that day is the day of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit's here. So is that now? And if that's now, how come I don't know that? And, or do I know it and I don't know it? Or what does that look like? today in my life. How do I know that? Because when you read that, you go, that's absolute non-separation union. That's oneness. There's nothing but oneness in that. And then, so then it, I started asking that question, well, what, how? And you know, isn't it, Papa's so good, you know? It's like, it's like a little kid searching for Easter eggs, right? I mean, and, and they're still searching. And they find that Easter egg that's like out there in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the grass. You know, you find it, you're all excited. And then you get it and you pick it up and you're like, there's another one. And so you run for that one. And he just leaves like little Easter eggs to kind of lead you on the path that he's wanting to take you on of discovery as you keep searching. So I just kept searching. And so I had sort of this question, what does that look like in my life? What does that mean? And then it, I just happened to stumble on in early spring of 2017, a video with Paul Young and Baxter Kruger. And it led me to these verses right here. Uh, John 1, 1 through 3, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, and Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1. And then he, Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And in Hebrews 1, long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and upholds the universe by the word of his power. And 
it was like, oh, and then on that video, so I'm going to use these chairs because you guys have probably seen Baxter Krug do these chairs, and you've seen Brad Jerzak do the chairs, but I cannot tell the story of union and the Trinity without the Trinity. The soul represents the Trinity. It's amazing how one word can change everything. That word with in John 1 is pros, face to face. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was face to face with the Father. And the word was God. He was face to face with God in the beginning. And all things were created by him, and apart from him, Nothing has been created. There's nothing out here. Everything is in here. All of creation, whether seen, unseen, rulers, dominion. You know, let me say this. Heaven is in here. Hell is in here. Lake of fire is in here. All of creation is in here, in this relationship. You were created in this relationship. Like I would tell those guys in, in the prison, I said, you're not out here trying to get in. You're in. Now what are you going to do? What are you doing here? You're in. Find out who you are here because all things are created here. So all things were created here in Christ. Wherever Christ goes, so goes all of creation. So we were created, so Father, Son, Spirit. We were created in a family, by a family, to be a family. We were created in a family, by a family, to be a family. There's, everything is in here. So one time, I do a lot of driving for my work, and I was going from Steamboat to Dinosaur, Colorado, Northern Colorado. I'm cruising along. And I knew this. See, I'm really starting to capture on to this. There's nothing outside of this. There's, there's not. See, I, you guys, I grew up thinking it was like this. You know that? I mean, there's the father and the son and all the little minions hoping not to fall off the edge of the abyss. You know, and we were trying to just hope that we could hang on. And, and that's how it was. Well, when I began to realize... There's nothing outside of this. It was so freeing to change everything in my life. I stopped the fear and panic of, and started going, okay, well, I can't get out of their presence, so I might as well be in their presence and figure out what I'm to do in their presence and be a part of their presence and enjoy their presence and stop being frightful about not being in their presence. And one time I'm driving from Steamboat Springs to Dinosaur, Colorado, 65 miles an hour, and I've got two other people in my, in my vehicle, my truck, because I'm working, and uh, down the highway, if you've ever been down Highway 40, it's like long and straight. And I'm cruising, I'm listening to NPR, because I don't want to argue with these little kids over what music to listen to, so NPR, something non-threatening, just news, just talk stuff. And I'm listening to this story about how 98% of the wealth is held by 2% of the people because of all the crazy, crooked things they do to keep their wealth. And I'm finding myself getting a little upset at these guys because I'm thinking what they could do to change the world if they would just stop being so stinking greedy. And so I started thinking, well, okay, Jesus, I know they've got a great place. You've got a special place picked for them in heaven. And immediately, still driving, I was caught up. I was raptured in my vehicle at 65 miles an hour with two people in my vehicle. I didn't leave a pile of clothes on the seat. The truck didn't go careening and kill people. I was caught up. And let me tell you about this experience. I was caught up and I had no need. There was no need. I didn't need air. I didn't need water. I had no need my body was not telling me that I needed anything. I had no need, and I suddenly did not need those people to be punished. 
I didn't need them to be punished because punishment has to do with an illusion of lack. If it's lack, then we got to punish them to pay back what was taken or what was misused. But if there is no lack, because there is no lack in here. This is the full source of everything flowing. There is the very source of everything. There is no lack. It's not like you take a part of God and now there's a missing piece that he has to punish you for taking from him. There is no lack. When there is no lack, there's no need for retribution. There's no need to get even because it never happened. It's like taking a teaspoon of water out of the ocean. It's like it never happened. So I had no need. I knew that they have no need. And I began to realize, oh, yeah, there is no need with God. Lack is something that we imagine in our mistaken identity. And so, trying to get on track here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go right here. Okay. We were created here. There is no lack. We were created in that image. We were created, let us come, let us make man, come, let us make Adam, humanity, in our image. So we were created in the image. We were created in a face to face relationship. That's what we were created. So, Adam, we were created in a face to face relationship. And then the first Adam, they turned to the tree, and they ate from the tree. And then they took leaves from the tree to cover themselves. And then they hid in the tree. And then when God, Father, Papa comes and says, Adam, Adam, where'd you go in there? Where'd you go hide in there? And he said, we heard you coming, because we were no longer facing you. We heard you coming, and so we covered ourselves. And this father did not say, oh my God, I can't even look at you anymore. He said, who told you you were naked? You see yourself different now. You look the exact same to me. And they took the leaves, and they began to cover themselves. We were created in a face-to-face -to, -to, to have a face-to-face, -face, but we hide behind our fig leaves because no one can see the face of God and live. And that's true. Whatever false self you have created is going to die in a face-to-face -face with God. Created in a face. There's that verse says that um, we with unveiled faces. Put that up there. Did I, did I give you that one, Sasha? Uh, first Corinthians. Oh, yeah, okay. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains, remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So in, they took the fig leaves and they began to veil themselves from their face to face with their Father. You were created to not be veiled. We were created to have an unveiled face-to-face -face relationship with our Father, with our Creator. It says with unveiled face, we need to put down our agenda, put down our doctrine. We need to put down our stuff and come unveiled for this unveiled face-to-face -face because you can't reflect their glory if you have a fig leaf that you were hiding behind. Because what you begin to reflect is you. You begin to reflect back to yourself you and your image of who you think you are based on your knowledge of good and evil. 
But when we come unveiled, put that fig leaf down. Put it down. Come unveiled. Some people call it centering prayer. Some call it uh, meditation. Some call it listening prayer. Some call it mindfulness. I call it face-to-face because that's what we were created for. We were created in a face-to-face to have a face-to-face. Unveiled. And so I'm thinking, so just, just follow me here. So I'm, I'm thinking, how can the bride of Christ also be the body of Christ at the same time? And then I realized, it's when the bride comes into the bridal chamber and she lifts her veil for a face-to-face union with her bridegroom. And they consummate this marriage of oneness and union. And then what God has joined together, let no Adam separate. They become one flesh. That's when the bride becomes the body of Christ. When we come in and we remove the veil and we sit here letting go of our need to control everything. We sit here letting go of our agendas. Oh, God, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this. And he's saying, put that down. I know what you need. How about you and I just spend time here, heart to heart, face to face. Let me breathe into you. You know what the problem is? I think there are too many of us that want the wedding gifts without consummating the marriage. We want the spiritual gifts without the unveiling. Because when you get unveiled in a face-to-face, you start to lose your identity, but at the same time you find your identity because now you are a part of a bigger identity. And you find yourself a part of something so much bigger. But i got to lose my life to find my life. I have to come and just sit and let my agenda down and be in a face-to-face. And it works. It changes you. I guarantee you start practicing the face-to-face without an agenda, it will change you. You won't know it. You don't come here and get some heavy, revy kind of stuff like, oh my gosh, I got this such great revelation and stuff. And usually you sit here and like nothing happens. But then after a time, you just start having peace and you don't want to leave it. It's like you just like hanging out with God, without all the agendas and all the stuff. And then you walk away and the people around you, your close loved ones, begin to see you differently. They go, wow, you've changed. And you're going, when did that happen? I don't even know when that happened because it wasn't on my agenda to change it. I would come and I would sit in this face-to-face and I would have, <laughs> I'd have my list of things that needed changed. And when I started putting down my list of things that needed changed, what I found out is the things I think needed changed, he didn't change. The things that I didn't think they changed, that's what he started to deal with. And it gets to be a little messy. And it gets kind of, well, consummating a marriage gets to be messy. You know, and we're, we're getting ready here real quick to, um, to celebrate the, 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 med- the wedding feast. Or, you know, communion. Or I like to call it common union. It's about common union. It's where, where the bridegroom unveils his body to be consumed by his bride. He says, here I am. I'm unveiled for you. Consume me. And I thought, well, you know, why? If you're going to do something in remembrance, Jesus, why did you have bread and wine? Why did you like, do pillars of stones or something? Because... When you consume the bread, the bread comes inside of you and it begins to become a part of you until pretty soon you can't tell what is you and what is bread. Is it you or is it the bread in different form? That's what the common union, that's what consummating the marriage is about, is celebrating the feast of the wedding. And we have to come into an unveiled face-to-face for it to happen. We don't get it from a book. Revelation 2.17 tells us that. He says, for those that overcome, I will give uh, the hidden manna. 
the, what is this mysterious thing, this hidden manna, and I'll give a new name that no one knows except for the one that gives it and the one that receives it. You don't get your identity from a book. You get your identity from a face-to-face unveiled. That's when the truth of your being becomes the way of your being. In an unveiled, face-to-face, no agenda, no fig leaf, embrace with your creator, your bridegroom, the one you are destined for. So I want to close again with that mantra. And now, as I read it, now you can kind of visualize this razor's edge of reality, of where everything that I thought I was meets the truth of who he is. And it's on that razor's edge. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I refer to it in the book here, I refer to it as the magnetic pull. It's a magnetic effect. In you, deep at the core of your being, is a magnet. And you know how magnets are? The, the negative is just, boom, attracted to the positive. But you put two positives together and they just kind of repel against each other. Well, at the core of your being is the negative. And the Father is the positive. And your I am not identity that you've taken on is a false positive. So when you come into this face-to-face, you are drawn and pulled towards it. And then the I am not wants to turn from it. And then you're drawn to it. And then you want to turn from it. And that's the way we grow and mature and we learn to choose to turn. It's not about whether you just get changed. It's about growing to a place of choosing. I wish I had George McDonald's quote. I should have brought it. He said, the annihilation of evil is not the death of evil. When evil chooses to do good, that alone is the annihilation of evil. It's our choice to turn back to a face-to-face with our Father in spite of how much we want to turn away. We keep coming back. That's where it's at. So here's the razor's edge. Where my wounds touch his healing, I find my identity. That's this face-to-face. Where my weakness touches his strength, I find my perseverance. Where my surrender meets his embrace, I find my destiny. It's on this razor's edge of reality, I find my message to deliver to the world. I am the message. I am his resurrection in the world. I am his resurrection in the world. I am his second coming. We are his second coming. He's here. The kingdom of God is in you. Don't be looking for it to come. Spend time in a face-to-face. Be drawn into it and let it start to just come out of you without you putting forth all the effort for it. So on that, on the eve of the, the wedding, the, the feast, and Jesus, he took that bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that I am unveiling for you to have. So any time that you, you break this and gather for this, you are remembering me. You are putting me back together. And he took the, took the cup And he poured the wine, and he said, whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. The the covenant that we are establishing, the, the wedding covenant that we are establishing. And whenever you do this, you are remembering me. You are acknowledging our covenant And as the bread and the wine go into you and you consume Christ, 
there comes a point where you can't tell what is you and what is Christ. Is that the bread? Or is that the bread in a new form? Is that me? Or is that the bread? It's all about union and being brought back into union. And we have to grow into that union. And we have to endure to that union. And we keep turning back to a face-to-face. Because every time our I am not wants to turn back to the leaf, to the fig tree, to the tree. But the core of our being, the I am in you, keeps calling back to the Father. God is in you out looking for God. So the white cups are juice and the dark cups are wine. Take a piece of bread, dip it into the wine and consume your bridegroom and consummate your marriage. Okay. I'm lost without you I'm desperate for you And so, Lord God, we say we're lost without you. We're desperate for you. And St. Paul says, well, in him you live and move and have your being. And so, Lord God, I must be lost in myself behind all those fig leaves. And that anxiety and that darkness and that doubt must somehow be in. The, the big bang must have happened inside of you, Lord God. And you say that you're going to fill all things. And so you're going to fill this universe with the glory of your presence. You're going to fill me and you're going to remove the blinders and you're going to show us who we truly are. And Lord, I thank you that we uh, return to the place that we come from. And like T.S. Eliot said, we know it for the first time. This is home. Oh, and this is, there's no place I call. So God, uh, thank you for allowing us to go on this weird little journey we call this world. And that you will bring us home and we will realize there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And Lord God, you are our home. And that is such incredibly good news. And so Lord, I uh, thank you that uh, you're not lost. In fact, you even descended into my lostness. And you're the one that speaks uh, for me to the Father. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for your gospel, the good news. I pray, Lord God, that we could preach it, proclaim it, not because you're desperate that someone would do it, but because we would enjoy the fact that uh, our dad is good, that God is good, that we love you and we want to worship you all the time. It's in your name that we thank you, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Hey, so thanks, Michael, for preaching the gospel to us. So, so, uh, Michael and I talked to Michael and Ray quite a bit, and they're always like, yeah, it's your tribe from the other side of the continental divide. So that means anybody that needs gas or money or anything, they go to the other? Okay, yeah, so, so uh, all right. So by way of benediction, what do I say? What do we say? Yeah. Believe the gospel, amen. And if you'd like to pray with someone, Ted's down front here. He'd love to spend some time praying with you. And hopefully I'll see you uh, next week when we begin our new series, all right?